I get the honor of introducing our next speaker, who is a friend of mine. Uh, there are a handful of people, as I've, you know, I've been living here at Morningstar for just two years. I've been following Morningstar for many years. But there are a handful of people who I consider keepers of the flame. And Joel Corey, who has been a son of this house for many years, he is our incredible, he's like the head Levite over every all sound technicians here at Morningstar. He is an incredible producer. He's produced a number of Kalani CDs, incredibly talented, and he is an awesome awesome teacher. He's a worship leader as well. He and his wife, De his wife, Destiny, lead worship here at Morningstar, and they are definitely keepers of the flame of what God has been birthing in this house over, the dec over these decades. So will you help me welcome my friend, Joel Corey? Thanks, Gary. Good morning. It is an honor to be here with you today. And it's also humbling to speak to you right before lunch. There, there's a strange feeling when you stand bet between this many people and their meal, you know what I mean? Uh, so I'm just gonna go with the scripture, I'm writing it now. Uh, Blessed is the man who preaches before lunch for he shall finish right on time. So today, I, um, I have a word I want to share with you on carrying the presence. But last night when we were in worship, I, I really felt that I was meant to share some of my testimony. Um, I honestly have not done this publicly before. Uh, but we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So if you're, if you're up for, for the journey, uh, let's overcome together today, okay? So I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida. I was born and raised. At a young age, I experienced SRA. And for many of you who probably don't know what that is, it stands for sexual ritualistic abuse. And for almost two years, my brother, sister, and I were subjected to this. And I'm not gonna go into details, there's no need. Um, to me, that's not the significant part of my testimony. Uh, what's important to know is that it was traumatic, it was devastating, and the enemy sought to destroy me before my life even began. There are three things that I know saved my life. The first, is that there was a God who had his hand over my heart. And in the midst of that abuse, in the midst of that atrocity, he stood before me and said, Satan, you will not have this one. Amen. Amen. The second thing, and these next two are a one-two punch. I was raised in a word of faith church that taught me from, the, from a young age the power of the name of Jesus. And I was filled with the spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues at a very, very young age. And this was so important because no one could foresee the battle that I was about to enter into, but the Lord knew and I was equipped. It's so important for our children uh, not just to go to Sunday school and have a fun time with their friends and draw with crayons, but to be filled with the spirit, to be filled with the word and to be given authority at a young age. Because as we all know, the enemy is targeting our children younger and younger. And the second is that I had a spirit filled praying mother who stood in intercession between my life and the gates of hell and said, you will not take my son. So after everything came to light, there was a season of court cases and trial and it was, it was almost as traumatic as the earlier events. Uh, once the court cases stopped, I was tormented by night terrors for a long time. Uh, there, were, there were nights that I would wake up in my front yard uh, where I'd run out of my bed and run out of the house and many nights that I would lay on my back 
paralyzed with, with the feeling of a weight pressed down on my chest. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't speak. And in the midst of all of that, I had this thought, and I was like 10 years old, I had this thought, if this is real, if this torment that I'm experiencing is real, if this terror that I know is real, then God must be real. And in that moment, I remembered a puppet show that we used to do in my kids' church. Uh, Pastor Angelo D'Amico uh, filled probably more kids with the Holy Spirit than anyone could ever imagine. He was doing work in that Sunday school classroom. But there was a puppet skit and, and, and the first puppet would be kind of in the front and they'd be talking and then in the back, this little devil puppet would come up and we'd all scream the name, Jesus! And the devil puppet would run away. And this thought went through my mind. <laughs> If I can just speak the name of Jesus, this fear will have to lift, this, this oppression will have to flee. And I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this kind of fear or night terror, um, witchcraft, but sometimes it's so hard just to get your mouth open, just the pressure and the weight. And there are times that I, I would even feel like I slept underneath my mattress in the box spring and just trying to hide from this terror. And I just remember fighting and it was so hard to get out the name of Jesus. Sometimes it just felt like I would mumble, Jesus, and it would lift and I could breathe and I felt the peace of God. And to be honest, in those early nights, it would come right back. The terror and the fear would press back against me. I would shake and tremble and sweat and cry and finally get out the name of Jesus. And sometimes my mom would hear me and she'd come in from the other room and pray in the spirit over me. And here's what happened though. Through these exercises, the time between experiences got longer and longer and longer and longer. So at one point, the days turned to weeks and the weeks turned to years. But my faith was being strengthened every time I had one of these encounters. In our house, spiritual warfare wasn't a fad or a new book that we had read. It was a matter of life and death. And it was as ever present as inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. It was just that part of life. And my heart burned for God. I understand now why David in Psalm 27, when he talks about his enemies surrounding him, his next, his next phrase isn't, but I'll rise up and fight back. It says, but in your house, O oh God, my heart longs to be with you because I found my refuge in the house of God. I found my rest and my peace and my mental stability and my ability to function in the presence of God. Amen. I chased hard after God through high school. Uh, my friends would invite me to go party on Friday nights and I, I would say, oh, I've got, I've got other plans. And those other plans were oftentimes with a group of 70-year-old intercessing church mothers, waving flags, playing djembes, and decreeing and declaring prophecies over the city of Jacksonville. We had meetings during that time called Fire and Glory with Dan and Marty Duke. We had Fanning the Flame meetings at New Life Christian Fellowship, Watchers on the Wall meetings at the Father's House, and then of course the Brownsville Revival. And I knew when I walked into the parking lot of the Brownsville Revival that God was in my midst. I knew that there was something different going on there than anything I had ever experienced before. And it placed in my heart a yearning and a desire for the revival fire to burn across this land. And there's kind of a problem when you encounter something like that because after that, nothing else really satisfies. Nothing else. It's like, oh, that was such a powerful service. It was such an amazing meeting. And you're like, oh, but there's more. Oh, but there's more. And so I had to learn, in the, learn how to live in that divine tension of God, thank you for your spirit in our church. Thank you for the move of your spirit. And then I'd go to my prayer closet. But God, I know there's more. But God, I know I'm desperate for more. 
In my junior year of high school, someone slipped me a burned CD copy of a Morning Star worship album. <laughs> and this was before YouTube, so there was no video to go along with it. So I, in my imagination, just made up my own mind of what things looked like, what they sounded like, what they felt like. Um, if I'm being completely honest with you, I, for the longest time, thought that Don Potter was black. <laughs> I've told him that before. So imagine the first time I walked into a conference <laughs> and I heard this voice that resonated in my spirit come out of Don, and I said, huh. <laughs> Susie was about exactly what I pictured, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, the first time I saw her at a conference, she had on combat boots and a wedding dress, and I was like, that's exactly what I thought that looked like. But I heard a sound in that CD that I had only until then known in my spirit. Have you ever had an encounter like that? It's like you know in your spirit that something is out there, but you don't have words, you don't have language, you couldn't describe it, and then you hear it and there's a, it rings your body like a bell. You're just like, oh, you know, there it is. I've been looking for this my whole life. I didn't know in my mind it existed, but my spirit has longed for it, and now I found it. And I chased that sound, and it made things a little awkward for me in my uh, early morning school worship group because, you know, they're all out there singing like Baby Shark, and Lord, I lift your name on high. And then here I come with my acoustic guitar and I'm like, and we cast down the spirit, you know, and I'm taking authority over things in my school and their eyes are big as saucers. And man, uh, you know, a little uncomfortable, but we got through it. Uh, and one night, late at night, um, I used to just put worship music on in my room and go on these experiences and journeys with the Lord and the spirit. And one night, as clear as I'm speaking to you now, I heard Rick and Don call my name. And it was like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I got up out of my bed. I went to my mom. I said, Mom, I, I, I have to talk to you. I just, I just felt a word from the Lord. She said, oh, honey, you know, go to bed. We'll talk about it in the morning. I said, no, if I go to sleep, I'll talk myself out of it when I wake up. I've got to talk to you now. And so she came out to the kitchen and I said, Mom, I, I know I've been working to go to college. I know I've got these scholarships available. I know that, you know, we had a plan but God spoke to me tonight and I heard my name called and I have to go to North Carolina. I know I'm supposed to go to Morningstar. And my mom, thank God, she, she was a spirit-filled and a spirit-filled lady. So the next time I got out of school, we had a break. We packed my whole family up into a minivan. And again, this is before the internet. So we just map quested the directions to the address on the back of the final quest. <laughs> and I'll never forget coming into North Carolina, it's the furthest away from home I'd ever been. And we start driving down Lancaster Highway and it gets more sparse and more empty. And I'm like, well, maybe it's like, Surely this is at Rick's house, you know, I don't, I don't really know. And uh, back then it was in this office building called the EOB that was, it looked like an old, uh, you know, like a, a plantation house. It was big brick and pillars and stuff. And so the next morning we pull up and I knock on the door and uh, Cindy Bryant answers the door uh, who was working as a as sort of running everything back then. And I just said, I'm here. <laughs> And she said, okay, what are you here for? I said, I don't know, uh, but, but here I am. And she said, well, you know, we have a school of ministry. We have this. And I said, you did that. Yes, that. And so I signed up for the school of ministry and um, I was accepted. I moved up here and I found my tribe. I found my community. I found my people, but I also found spiritual fathers uh, the first year that I was in the school of worship, uh, Ray Hughes was our teacher and he was over the school of worship. And it was the first time that any man in my life had put their hand on my heart and told me who I was and gave me permission to be everything that God had created me to be without apologizing for what that looked like or what that sounded like. At the same time, we started to take trips up to Moravian Falls to the worship center and Don Potter entered my life. And in Don, I saw, mm -mm, woo, I saw everything that I wanted to be.
So my friends and I, we started writing songs. We started writing music together. Uh, we got really excited. We were going to record a worship album. We went into the studio. I was working two jobs at the time and going to school and saved up my money and went into the studio for the first time. And, uh, you know, we're in there to, to, to worship and we wanted to do spontaneous prophetic worship. And so I said to the engineer, hey, uh, after this, would you just kind of let the tape roll? We're just going to see what the Holy Spirit does. And, you know, through the talkback mic, he's like, well, what's the Holy Spirit going to do? And I said, uh, I don't know, you know, we we're just going to kind of leave some space. You know, in hindsight, I should have just said, hey, man, we're going to jam at the end of this song. But that just felt a little bit not really what we were going for. So I was like, well, I don't really know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Just, you know, let it roll and we'll see. And he said, well, I don't know how to mic the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and everybody behind the glass laughed and had a big chuckle. And I felt about this small and we all just felt incredibly like humiliated. And that's when I realized we're gonna have to figure out how to do this. Um, at that point, I never really had a whole lot of ambition to be a producer, an engineer, or do anything in the studio, but it literally was just birthed out of necessity. And so I started taking some correspondence courses, some certificate courses from Berkeley and stuff like that while I was still in ministry school, but I knew I had to get trained and equipped because there was this sound that we had in our hearts and did not know how to get it out and how to release it. And so I started doing that, started doing these little recordings. They were really bad, really bad, really bad. Then things started to sound a little bit better. And then my two friends, Jonathan and Melissa Helser, came to me and said, Joel, we want you to record our live worship album. And um, I just said, sure. You know, I, I was excited about the idea. At that point, I had only recorded on like two channels in a Pro Tools rig in, in my room, you know. So I went from that to 42 channels of madness, uh, songs that were two and three hours long. And here I was saying, God, you're gonna have to help me. And, but there's this really cool thing when they talk about the building of the tabernacle. And uh, I always say his name wrong, uh, Bezalel. It says that he was anointed for all things having to do with the creation of the tabernacle. And I'm telling you, there is an anointing from God that will rest upon your life when you say yes, that extends your capabilities, goes beyond your experience, and allows you to do things that in your natural capabilities would be impossible. And so I just said, yes. And so we did it. And it's a, it, you know, it was so powerful and so awesome. And then from there, you know, we did stuff with John Mark McMillan and Josh Baldwin and uh, all these, you know, all of our community just started to release albums and release music. And we had just an amazing season of time. It was powerful. Then in 2008, I don't know what happened, but I'll say a lot happened. A lot happened, and I was struck by a wave of disillusionment, and it led me to a place of despair. And in that moment, like so many in my generation that I ran with at the time, uh, my world fell apart. And I have so many friends that we all ran together during that era that their lives just hit a wall somewhere in that window. And people try to come up with phrases like deconstruction and, you know, dark, dark, dark night of the soul. That's kind of what I thought I was going through. Um, honestly, it was kind of, deconstruction sounds like there was some kind of like strategy involved, you know, like you build a, you build a Lego house and you're like, I'll take this part off and put it over here, put this part. Mine was kind of like you build a Lego house and then your three-year-old sister comes in like Godzilla and is like, ha, psh, you know, it literally was everything that could be shaken was shaken everything that was shaken. And I entered in to a very dark season of my life. And if I'm being honest with you, I fell into sin and I fell away. I loved the Lord in my heart. I would say to you, oh, I never stopped loving God. The problem with that is 1 John 5, where it says, if you love God, you will keep my commandments. And so during that season, I felt this, uh, this emotional connection to God that never went away, but my life did not reflect the love that I had for God. 
And at my lowest point, when things were the darkest, I heard the enemy say, you have become your father. The one thing that I vowed in all of my life that I would never do, all of a sudden I was confronted that at the same age he was, when all the things went down, that I was abusing alcohol, that I was living in sin, and the enemy sprung the trap. And I, right in that moment, was really the climax of the story where I could have chosen in that moment to set up my camp and live out my days under that lie. But I promise you, not even a second went by that I heard the voice of God as clearly as I ever have in my life. And he said, I am your father. And I wanna tell you, for all my theology and all my doctrine and all the things that had been shaken and all the things that I had wrestled with and all the things that I'd struggled to believe or comprehend or make sense of or compartmentalize, all of that was blown out of the water because up until that point, I had known God on the mountaintop. But in that moment, God saw me and knew me and loved me in the valley of my despair. And it shattered and reconciled all things unto him in my life. Because I realized God didn't just love me when I was on a platform. God didn't just love me when I was producing music. God didn't just love me when I was fasting and praying and shouting so loud and screaming his name and believing him for a revival amongst the nations. He didn't just love me then, he loved me in the darkest of my nights. And I love this song that Destiny's grandmother wrote, Dottie Rambo. And it says, it's dark as a dungeon and the sun seldom, seldom shines. And I question, Lord, why must this be? Then he tells me there's strength in my sorrow and there's victory in trials for me. He leads me beside still waters somewhere in the valley below. And he draws me aside to be tested and tried. In the valley, he restoreth my soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Destiny, I met my wife here at Morningstar. Uh, shortly after that experience, the Lord, you know, really put it on my heart to come back and to, to plug in here. And I was like, Lord, I don't know. Um, and then that day, I'm sitting on my front porch. David Valier calls me. Molly and him had been talking and said, hey, Joel, I don't know if you even be interested in this right now, but we would like for you to come and produce an album for us. And I said, David, you're not going to believe this, but all day I've been thinking about calling you. Yes, I am there. And I sat right over there in those leather chairs across from Rick Joyner. And I told him everything that I was going through. I told him everything that God was doing in my life. And he looked at me in the eyes and he said, well, that certainly doesn't disqualify you. Welcome back to the fray. And so now the cry of my heart is this, Isaiah 55, 12. For you shall go out from the spiritual exile caused by sin and evil into the homeland with joy and be led forth by your leader, the Lord himself and his word with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Thank you, Jesus. And so in that, I just want to say two things. One, for all of you praying mothers who are standing and believing, for prodigals, don't stop praying. Don't stop contending. I know that it was the prayers of my mother and the relentless pursuit of the heart of God that would not let me stray and would not, even in those seasons of darkness, would not let me go so far that I could not find my way back. And I know that there was a hedge of protection around my life. There was angelic charge placed over the seed that God had planted inside of me to keep it and to protect it until this day and this hour. And I will forever 
never be thankful for that. So please contend, wrestle, do not shy away. Do not give up hope for the battle is the Lord's and he will not stop until the victory is ours. Amen. So I wanna shift gears just a little bit. I wanna talk a little bit about carrying the presence. And you're like, okay, this is, we're talking about MTV now. Just go with me. Just think about, this is another song, right? Like we're worshiping, we sang that song, quick brief. Now we're going to another song. Picture it, United States of America, 1979. I wanna do that in my best Sophia Petrillo accent, right? From Golden Girls. Picture it, 1979, United States of America. I can see some of you are like, I don't want to picture 1979. <laughs> I feel you. I get it. Uh, 1979, McDonald's introduced the Happy Meal. The Pittsburgh Steelers won the Super Bowl. And disco music dominated the sales in the music industry. You know what I mean? Ooh, ooh. You know? Some of you remember that. I don't. Um, but a crazy thing happened from 1979 to 1980. There was a revolution in the taste of music listeners and overnight disco music went out of style. It was over, yeah. <laughs> Yay. The music industry at that time suffered the greatest losses in all of history. The losses were even greater than peer-to-peer -peer sharing in Napster, which is hard to believe. It was that bad. They had poured millions and millions of dollars into records and vinyl and tangible copy that would never sell. And so the music industry was desperate to find a way to make sure that this never happened again. At the same time, Jack Schneider, who was an ex-CBS radio executive, began working on a new idea. Now, Jack was kind of an old, like, Mad Men style guy. You know, he was like uh, high, and I think he was like the CEO or one of the top of, of CBS radio at the time. And there was this thing happening where CBS radio was starting, radio itself as a format was starting to decline. And he could sense that the winds were changing and that there was this new medium called TV. And he started to think, how can we go even further with television? And he started to think about cable television. Television, but it costs money, right? And they could control the format and they could control what went over the airwaves. Now, Jack, Jack Schneider um, brought another man on who was also in his 50s named Robert McGordy. Now, these two men, along with a guy named Lack, they joined together with the music industry and they came up with the idea of music television, television that would promote music. Sounds like a great idea, right? Let's get some clips, let's get some stuff. What they didn't realize when they first started to test it in Columbus, Ohio, in the middle of America, about as white bread and Captain Crunch as you can get, they started to air music video clips at night. And within a week, they saw a kid walking down Main Street dressed like Billy Idol. They said, oh, this is bigger than music. This is the culture. We can indoctrinate the culture with this. And so these two men in their late 50s who were at the end of their career in their medium and in their technology began working to create MTV. And the most impactful and sustained youth culture movement in modern history was launched by two late aged radio ex executives. When I read that, the Lord quickened my spirit and I felt like I had an encouraging word for some of us this morning. You see, they didn't grasp the technology or the culture, but they knew the intricacies of mass communication and how to wield the power of advertising. And I wanna to say to some of you in this room today, especially those that are over the age of 50, you may not understand the technology. You may not understand the culture, but you know God and how to stand steadfast on the word. 
You have passed through fire and wilderness and been victorious in many battles. And you stand to this day as a testimony of God's faithfulness. This generation needs you more than you will ever know. Your journey has just begun. Amen. The enemy has tried to convince you that what you carry is obsolete by confronting you with the lie of relevance. I used to say this in worship schools in the early 2000s and it got me in a lot of trouble because relevance was such a hot topic term. But I used to say, relevance is a lie from the pit of hell, spoken to keep the church at the mercy of the ever shifting winds of a lost and dying culture. Relevance was presented as a means to gain popularity. But let me ask you this, how relevant is an ark to a people who have never seen rain? How relevant was a carpenter from Nazareth? Even Nathaniel said in John 1:46, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I thought about making a joke there about a random city and then I thought someone in here might be from that city and uh, come and get me. Don Potter in his book, Facing the Wall. How many of you read Facing the Wall? Facing the Wall. I just wanna encourage you, if you haven't read that book, it changed my life. It's such a powerful book as it relates to worship and our connection with God and, and knowing him and knowing him intimately. But he makes this amazing picture. He draws this beautiful picture of a jester entertaining in the court of a king. He said, many fools in the court realize that displeasing the king could get you killed. So they instead focus their efforts on the approval of the crowd. The problem with trying to please the crowd instead of the king was that there were as many opinions of what was good as there were people in the crowd. No one could possibly please everyone. Yet many fools realized it would be easier to just try and please the king than to be continually reshaping oneself to fit the fickle demands of the public. And then he asks us the question, whose fool will I be today, the kings or the crowds? Whew. I want to be a fool for the king. I want my eyes to be set upon his eyes. I want my heart to be fixed upon his heart. I want my only desire to be to please him. So we can see now in hindsight, after this wave of relevance ran through the church, that chasing the winds of relevance and the cur currents of culture has led many to be mired in the Sargasso Sea of wokeness. Sargasso Sea, I know that's an obscure reference, but I'm telling you, it makes sense. Does anybody, is it, you want me to tell you what the Sargasso Sea is? I'll tell you. It's this little patch of the Atlantic Ocean up in the north. And because of the way that the currents work, it takes all the trash from the ocean and it pushes it into this one pocket called the Sargasso Sea and it traps it there. The Sargasso Sea also is historically where sailing ships making their way from Europe to America would oftentimes stall out because the wind don't blow in the Sargasso Sea. So they'd either have to break out the oars and strive their way out or turn back around and go home. So we can see now that chasing the winds of relevance in current culture has led many to become mired in the Sargasso Sea of wokeness. God, let us be a people who cast down the idol of popularity, who lay aside the idol of success and pursue your heart at all costs. So as MTV began to develop, they started to implement these tactics to reach the generation. The first thing they did was to go into cities and identify early adopters. So they'd go into New York or major metropolitan cities. They'd find kids that dress different, listen to different music, and they'd interview them and they'd pay them 50 bucks and say, hey, tell us, tell us what you're into. What do you like? What do you, what do you listen to? Where do you eat? What do you, where do you get your clothes? Yada, yada, yada. They'd start filling out this idea to see where trends were heading before they had a chance to naturally ebb and flow. They wanted to get ahead of the curve. So they began to predict trends. 
The next thing they realized is that when they took their cameras into a real life establishment, like say a, a nightclub or a beach party, that everyone started to act the way that they saw people act on TV in those scenarios. They called this a feedback loop of suggestion. So they suggested an expectation. And then when they went into a place, people acted and responded in the way that they had projected. Does that make sense? They called this a feedback loop. And they realized by doing this and the shift from, okay, music, television, we can impact dress. We can, we can impact what people eat, where people go, what people do for fun. Then they took it even a step further and began reality TV. And they, they realized if we can sell the people on a lifestyle, then all these other things will come underneath it. And by doing so, they began to indoctrinate the youth. Now, why am I going back to this history? Why are we talking about MTV? It's not even relevant anymore. I'm telling you this because a lot of the things that we are encountering today find their roots in this movement. Before this, uh, industry was pretty responsive. They'd start to see a trend in a certain music or a certain style of car, and they'd say, hey, call manufacturing. We got to get these things out there. They're flying off the shelf. So people responded to the trends of uh, the consumer. This was the beginning of predictive advertising and predictive uh, culture infiltration. And that is what we wrestle against today in the algorithm and in these different things that are constantly trying to throw stuff at us. Uh, you know, they link our grocery card to our Instagram account, our Instagram account to our email, and you go to the grocery store and you buy cat food, and all of a sudden it says you're getting Instagram ads for cat litter. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it's like they're trying to predict and always trying to steer you toward the next project. And what I'm saying is, these are the tactics, this is the mechanisms, these are the efforts of the world to steer our lives. And what I want to say to us today is that we must be careful not to attempt to employ the means and methods of the world to carry this move of God. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say, I'm not talking about any past movement or current movement. I am speaking directly to what I believe is coming and what is upon us now, okay? I am in no way talking about anyone or any methods that are happening right now. But I do want to say, Uzzah died to teach us this lesson. The Philistines had carried the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. And so when the Philistines were defeated and the Ark of the Presence came back to Israel, what did they do? They built a better cart. And this, I'm saying, is our challenge today. The presence of God will not be carried on the back of a, of a cart. In 2 Samuel 6, verse 6, then came to the threshing floor of Nikon, and Uzzah reached out toward the ark of the Lord and took hold of it because the oxen nearly upset it. He didn't intend to do anything wrong. He was simply trying to keep the ark of, of the presence. He was trying to keep the presence of God steady. But it says, the anger of Yahweh burned against Uzzah and God struck him down there for his irreverence and he died there by the ark of God. The cart represents the mechanisms of this world. It represents our efforts within our flesh and our natural capabilities to carry and promote a movement. Uzzah's hand represents man's will and desire to control. We must not treat that which is sacred as common or profane. This was the same Ark of the Covenant that went out before Moses as he took land 
as he overcame enemies in the wilderness. This was the same Ark of the Covenant that stood in the tabernacle night and day as offerings and sacrifices were being poured out in front of it. And this Ark of the Covenant, they felt so comfortable with it. They had this idea of familiarity with it, that it was just an object that could be toted along on the back of a cart or steadied by the strength of a man's hand. And God in that moment reminded them of his power and his sovereignty. Leviticus 22.15 says, the priests shall not profane the holy offerings the Israelites offered to the Lord. Sometimes familiarity can cause us to become a little bit too casual with the presence of God. I remember recently there was a revival and I saw posts on Facebook and I saw people's comments and it was almost like we'd become sommeliers of the spirit. You know, like people who really know wine and they like swirl it and they smell it and they're like, mm. It's like people online were like, there are notes of, notes of the Brownsville revival with a little bit of the fragrance of the airport revival. And, and if, you, if you taste it just right, you know, it's just a little of this, a little of that. And, and criticizing, just kind of critiquing the move of God and, and saying, you know, oh, this reminds me of these other things that I've been a part of. And I'm telling you what is coming will be like nothing we've ever seen before. And I believe... And I believe that in this hour, God wants to give us tender baby hearts. He wants to give us hearts that are so full of awe and wonder. We recently were in a, a School of the Prophets meeting. And I, if you have a heart for prophetic worship, if you have a heart for prophecy, I encourage you more than anything else to get involved with these, whether it's online or here in person. But I was sitting in one of the School of the Prophet meetings and one of the activations that Chris led us in was, um, he said, sometimes the Lord can speak to us through songs. I was like, yes, I love that. Because as a worship leader, he speaks to me through songs all the time. And Chris said, let's just take a second and let's just listen. And the Lord is going to give you a song and he's going to speak to you. And I was sitting back at the sound, sound booth. I was running sound for that meeting. And as soon as he said it, almost like someone turned a radio on in the room. This is the song I heard. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> but, but, but baby, you just ain't seen no, 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 nothing yet. And I felt like that was a word for us. And that is a word for the church. And that's no small thing because many of you in this room have seen a lot. You've seen miracles, you've seen breakthroughs, you've lived through revivals, you've seen things that some of us could only dream of. But the spirit of the Lord would say to you today, you ain't seen nothing yet. A spirit of awe and wonder is leading us into a season of miraculous creativity. God wants our hearts to be captivated by awe again. As worshipers, it's time for us to stop chasing the next hit song or trendy aesthetic and start pouring out our lives as a company of redeemed worshipers who will not bow their knee to the idol of success, but will offer up their lives as a sweet smelling, fragrant offering before the God of all creation. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. I love this verse because that last line, it's a beautiful picture in the Hebrew. I did a long word study on it and it actually means where it says he will make your path straight. It's like an archer pulling back an arrow and aiming it for the target. You see, we have to trust him for the target. When we start setting the target for our own path of trajectory, we start to lean like a bent arrow. And I don't know if any of you have ever shot a bent arrow, but you might wanna warn your neighbors first. <laughs> we wanna be straight arrows. We wanna trust him, not only to propel us, but to propel us in the direction of the target. I like to say this in the studio. I don't, I don't create a target and aim for it. I let God fire the arrow and then paint the target around it. Yeah. 
the Lord is calling us to authenticity because authenticity is rooted in the truth. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and never sell it. Never sell the truth, never sell your authentic sound. Our authentic sound, voice, expression, movement, design is a gift from God that we must protect at all costs. Once it is exploited for popularity, fame, wealth, or success, it does not replenish itself. Authenticity is not a renewable resource. I think a lot of us sometimes mistake and think that it is. But you're given one shot to be authentic. If you trade that in to sell something, it's impossible to renew in yourself that authenticity. But how many, are you, how many of you are glad in here tonight that authenticity is not renewable, but authenticity is redeemable? Because there is nothing lost that the blood of Jesus cannot restore. I believe that God is restoring the sound. We are on the verge of a mass movement of redeemed authenticity. I believe we are gonna see worshipers from all over the earth be set free from the traps of self-promotion and the pool of popularity. Amen. If you agree with me, let's just say this together. This will be fun. Now, now is the time to, the time to lock, eyes lock eyes with the lion. Now is the time to lock eyes with the lion. This is the time for us to fix our gaze. on the eyes of our maker. I'll tell you this, I believe it with all my heart. This is a season and a time for us to lay aside the distractions. This is a time and a season for us to lay aside the things of the world that tried to convince us that we needed to do them in order to succeed. We live in a culture that equates popularity with power. How many times do we see in this social media world that we live in, someone make a name for themselves because of how many marshmallows they can stuff in their mouth on TikTok? And the next thing you, you know, you see them on the news and the anchor is saying, hey, so what do you think about the economy? And this guy's like, rrr, 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 rrr. like we well, heard it here, folks. You know, this is the expert's take. Popularity does not equal power. And I'll take it a step further. Popularity does not equal truth. There is a power in obscurity. And I feel like there might even be people in this room who have given up because of disappointment, because you felt like the gift that God had put inside of you had not yet found a place. You felt that the gift that God had given you had not yet found a room or a platform. You felt like, oh, I sing, but no one listens. Oh, I speak, but no one cheers. Oh, I, I, I write books, but nobody reads them. And I'm telling you, there is a place in this generation that just like Samuel was covered by his mother when he went into the temple to protect him from the evil that was taking place in that day, in that hour. There are many of you who have been under the covering of the Most High, that God has kept your calling. God has kept your purpose. God has kept your voice unto himself because today is the day for you to be revealed. Now is the hour for your voice to be heard. This is the moment that you were created for. And I would encourage you this morning to cast aside disappointment, to cast aside those places where you gave up on prophetic words because they didn't happen in the timeline and in the way that you expected them to. For the Lord is saying that word will not return to me void. It just hasn't happened yet. 
And I wanna remind some of you this morning of those promises that you've held on to. I wanna remind some of you this morning of those words that God has spoken over your life in the night seasons. I wanna remind you of the gift that he placed inside of you. And I wanna speak to the well of living water within your soul. If you feel that and you feel God doing something in you, I just, I just wanna encourage you to close your eyes for just one second. In the name of Jesus, I speak to the wells of living water and I call them forth now to spring up, bubble up from the depths, rivers of living water, rivers that pour forth from the throne of God. Spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and that lie upon. Let's sing it with faith. Let's sing it as a declaration. Spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me that light upon me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.